So we are continuing tonight with the letter to the seven, the seven churches here. And we've already looked at the church of Ephesus, the church of Smyrna, the church of Pergamos, and tonight we'll be looking at the church here of Thyatira. And in the text tonight that we have before us here, your translation, if you will, your introduction would probably be calling it the, the corrupt church. And I kind of called it Jezebel's church. There's much said about Jezebel here in this word of Jesus to the church of Thyatira. Now, as we look at this, remember that this is really uh, Jesus' word to the churches. The, the book of Revelation kind of has a, an order of sequences or events of things that are taking place. And initially, the book itself starts with this revelation of Jesus. And the revelation of Jesus is what should ultimately impact, really, its readers more than anything. That's what the book is, a revelation. Um, it, I have to repeat this and say it because it seems that there are some that think this is more than one. And so they'll say the book of Revelations. It's not Revelations. It's a revelation. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ. Ultimately, this is what the entirety of the book is all about. It, it, it reveals the person, the work, the plan, the ultimate fulfillment of Christ in the New Testament and ultimately Christ and his church and the future kingdom. Now, last week we talked a little bit on the topic of truth. Now, remember that there was much to be said about Jesus's arrest um, you know, his betrayal by Judas Iscariot. Jesus goes before Pontius Pilate, you know, and there was much to be asked concerning Jesus and who he was. And remember that there were several questions that Pontius Pilate had. And the ultimate question that Pontius Pilate asked is, what is truth? Remember that Jesus had, had declared this same thing in that in John 14, 6, he said, He is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. No one comes unto the Father but by him. Now remember that the question that's asked by, by Pilate is a question that really kind of shows us the heart of the world. The world lacks truth. The truth is there, present, and yet it doesn't even know it. And ultimately, we see that clearly this is, what, this is what Pontius Pilate said in verse 38 of chapter 18. Pilate said to him, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. Now, remember that ultimately they were going to persecute Jesus and really put him to death for blasphemy. The blasphemy was because Jesus declared himself to be God. This was the reason why he was crucified. For the religious leaders, for them, it was a no-brainer. He's blasphemed, he calls himself to be the son of God, makes himself out to be God, and thus, as they say, you know, it's not lawful for us to put him to death. So this is why they brought him to Pontius Pilate. In other words, he says, they said to him, under our law, he would be, it would be punishable by death. Stoning is how the Jews would have put Jesus to death. Now, remember, we, we shared a little bit about this because I, I, I want to kind of get back on this topic of truth. Now, there's a lot of garbage, and I call it that because really that's what it is when it comes to the word of God, when it comes to what, you know, a church looks like or what it's supposed to look like. And today, church is viewed more for its possessions. It's viewed more for its attendance. It's viewed more for its um, wealth. It, it's become more 
um, how could we say um, pastors are, are elevated, they are viewed as, you know, superstars, if you will, and all of these things. And this is what church has become. And the point I'm trying to make is, you know, today some people will say, well, this is a very effective church. Look at, look at all that it has. This is the danger that we're running into. It, there is a direction that the world is going, and the direction that it's going is that it's choosing lies over truth, and it's praising evil over good. And this here kind of creeps its way into the church where the church itself loses its, its ability to be able to discern truth. And this is why we see the letter to the seven churches. They find themselves in a lot of problems. Remember, the church of Pergamos, you know, their, their main issue was it was a compromising church. They abandoned truth. And ultimately, we see that in one sense, you know, as the Lord commends them, he says, you know, you, you, I know your works and where you dwell is Satan's throne and you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas. But what's interesting is he says here to them in regards to his, you know, critique against them. He says, you, but I have these things against you. You hold to the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, verse 14, and eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. And notice what he says here. And thus you have also those who hold to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans in which things I hate. Now, remember, we kind of went over what is the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, but remember the church of Ephesus, what they were losing was their first love and they rejected those in verse 6 of chapter 2, he says, But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And so, Pergamos, well, notice here that they loved the Lord. They held fast to his name, even to the point of martyrdom and dying. But they also embraced this doctrine of the Nicolaitans. So, the church of Ephesus was rebuked for their loveless, you know, they were a loveless church, but yet they rejected the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. It's like the opposite with Pergamos. They were not loveless. They were actually, they had love. They had a love for the name of the Lord. They held fast to it, but they also embraced the false teachings of the Nicolaitans. So truth was not important to them. They, they would rather believe the lie than the truth. And this is why we have to be grounded and rooted in doctrine, in solid teaching. Because the days are going to come when, when our faith will be shook. When your truth that you say, that you believe, that the message of the gospel will be tested, not only by trials and suffering in our lives, but it's going to be tested by the world. It's going to be tested by the world system and Ultimately, this is kind of what we see overall in the book of Revelation. As you get further into the book, you're going to see the, this false religious system set up and many that will go that way. And you're going to see a lot of this. But this is the point that I want to make, that when truth is compromised, it doesn't matter how much you say you love God. The truth is already compromised. You love him for what? You love the things of God for what manner, in what way, and yet in the same, let's just say you have two hands, one individual, two hands, and with one hand you hold on to and hold fast to the name of the Lord, and with the other hand you hold on to and you hold fast to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans or false teaching. And so the warning to Pergamos, and this is going to lead us up into the church of Thyatira because it just seems like it goes from bad, you know, to worse, and then to worse. And so the charge to Pergamos was do not compromise your morality and do not compromise your theology. And this is why it's important. When, when Pontius Pilate asked the question, what is truth? 
The way I try to describe his question is this was a question for the ages. This would be something that we should endeavor to be seeking. See, with the church here of Thyatira, this church would be a church that would tolerate false teaching and corrupt morality. Notice that, false teaching and corrupt morality. And Jesus will speak to them. He'll be characterized by his penetrating and decisive judgment. And he's going to judge them. While those who hold fast to the true gospel will receive an ultimate reward, those who tolerate false teaching. And, and this is an interesting thing. And, and we kind of went on some false teachers and we went on that. And a lot of people, they kind of squirm, you know, because when they hear, you know, the, the false teachers that, that we call out. And, and the reason why we call them false teachers is because of what they teach. You know, they might be great people, but being a great person doesn't get you into heaven. You know, this, this has nothing to do with the person. It has everything to do with the teaching. And so how can a church go from one who once held the truths and the tenets of the faith? You know, when you look at the Apostles' Creed and you see how ultimately, you know, that is kind of laid out. It became the ultimate truth for, you know, the church in and of itself to be able to, you know, be unified under one statement. And ultimately, this is what the church was known by. And for those of you that don't know, I'll kind of just lay this out to you. The Apostles' Creed is, I believe in God the Father, Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and buried, he descended into hell, and on the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And from there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Notice the whole point. In the universal church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Now, this clearly, as you kind of look at the picture here in this whole idea of the Apostles' Creed, I mean, there's so much more that you can kind of look at the text in and of itself, but, but, but this is what they kind of viewed in that regard. And as it talks about this, you know, it really speaks of the person of Christ. Now, remember that the truth that Pontius Pilate was saying, what is truth? was before him, Jesus. And what does the Bible say about Jesus? Well, the Bible says that Jesus, ultimately the story of Christ is that he's God manifested in human flesh. It's like there are certain things within this truth about who Jesus is that we like to kind of leave out. Some we kind of relegate and we kind of say, well, that's just tradition, that's just religion, that's kind of what we've been taught. But then there comes points where you have to have those conversations who is Jesus to you? You'll find out very quickly that most who call themselves followers of Christ are not really followers of Christ at all. Their, their views of Jesus change and differ from yours. You know, when I first became a believer and I, and I first got saved, you know, um, I, it, it was new to me. Though, though raised, how could I say, brought up in the church, not taught the gospel, but just raised in the church. I understood what church was. I went to church as a kid. I, I, I understood that, that church was a place where we went, we received. So those things I understood. But if you were to ask me, what did I know about Jesus? All I would say is that, you know, Jesus was in heaven. You know, I didn't really understand the detail or the depths as a kid. You know, you don't, you don't really know. And then plus, I wasn't born again. I was just a kid. What I knew was what I had no choice but to know, you know, like the little kids today, you know, well, my parents make me go to church. Well, that's good. You have no choice. You're supposed to go. It's what it's good for you. Right. But but then there comes a point where you have to now kind of take, OK, what do I believe about the Lord? And when I got saved, 
and came to faith in Christ, I had those who preached the gospel to me, and obviously the Bible, and I just began to read. John's gospel, good book to start in. And you start to meet people, as I did, even before, even before I came, because in my mind, if anybody said they were Christian, I just put them all under the same thing. So before I came to faith. So if they said, I was, it could be a Jehovah's Witness, and they would have came to me, and they would have said, hey, well, we're Christians too. Oh, good, praise God. I didn't know no better. Mormons, hey, we're Christians, you know, and praise God, you know, kind of thing. Well, when I wasn't a believer and people came to me and they were saying things like, hey, well, we're Mormons, we're Christians, you know. I just remember that, you know, my grandmother would tell me that the Jehovah's Witnesses, that they weren't right. I didn't understand what she meant, but I trusted her because it was my grandmother and I thought she knew everything, right? So, and she was a very godly woman. So I says, you know, yeah, okay, they're, they're not right. But I didn't know what it was. I had a friend who was a Jehovah's Witness that lived next door to us in um, these apartments I grew up in. And uh, I remember when I would go want to go play with him in the afternoon, I would have to wait until they were done having Bible study in their living room. And in my mind, I was thinking like, oh, that's kind of cool. We don't have Bible study at our house and we go to church. But they did. And then he'd come out after and I'd be like, you guys have Bible study in your house? He says, yeah. He goes, we're... Uh, you know, we are studying to be witnesses or something like that. So I'm just like, oh, okay, they go to church, they're having Bible study, whatever that means, let's play kind of thing, right? But when I started to study the word of God and I started to read who Jesus is, those same type of people from the kingdom hall or from, you know, the Mormon church or whatever the case might be, and it all sounds good. It all sounds good. Like we're Christians too kind of thing, right? Do you believe in Jesus? Yes, we believe in Jesus. Okay, cool. You believe in God the Father. They both say, yes, we believe in God the Father. You know, the, the Jehovah's Witness prefer to call him Jehovah. And now today, before it was like you could never utter the word God. They didn't say God. They would always correct you like this. And this was at least my experience in, you know, in the late 90s and early 2000s. Like, you know, it's not God. He has a name. And they like wanted you to say Jehovah. Now, because they've been refuted and debated and literally now in the age of social media, now there's all this stuff out there and this has come out. Now they say they'll converse with you and they'll say God, you know, and they'll kind of start using the same verbiage that that we use. And and all of it is a ploy. It's all attacked. And even more so, they're not even using the New World Translation, their false Bible. They're they're using, uh, you know, like uh, translations that would support their uh, teachings and they're using Bibles like ours. And um, so they're, they're ready, they're equipped, they're prepared. Now, when I started to realize, hey, man, this is, this, something's off here. It was always on the person of Christ. Who is Jesus? It was always on the person of Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus? And ultimately, the Bible tells me that Jesus is God. The Jehovah's Witnesses Bible tell them that Jesus is not the almighty God, but that Jesus is a God. The Bible teaches me that God, the God that we serve, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the one true God, the only God, is a God who is monotheistic. And that those who worship him worship a God who is one. But their Bible says that he's a God. There's more than one God. Then they shied us and they, they challenge us on the doctrine of the Trinity. Boy, I shared with you guys many times on that debate back and forth. And ultimately, it becomes a doctrine thing. So bad doctrine, bad theology equates to a bad Jesus, not the true Jesus of Scripture, but the Jesus of their bad theology. And thus, they have no relationship with the Lord. And, and you might say things like, and I, and I don't only say this on the topic of truth because you know, as, as you guys know, part of my wife's testimony is that, you know, she was Jehovah's Witness. This is what she was raised. And she did the ministry that Jehovah's Witnesses did. She did the door to door. She did all those things that they did. She believed in this teaching. And ultimately, it was revealed in this teaching, you know, as, as she got older and she began to see there's some flaws here in this. And when she came to faith in Christ, 
and she met Jesus for who the scriptures say he was, then we begin to see things change. Her, her view of Christ changed. Then she realized, man, this is not the Jesus that was presented to me as a child. And this is not the church that was presented to me to be the church of Jesus Christ. This is the church of the kingdom hall. And their doctrine and their teaching is, is cultic. It's, you know, you know, the other not too long ago, I think I shared with you guys, I was called to go and do the invocation at the county supervisor meeting and we're sitting there you know and they says you got to lead the pledge of allegiance and as you know you know jehovah's witnesses they don't they don't salute the flag they never do they don't stand for the pledge of allegiance in school and some of you remember when you were in school those who were jehovah's witnesses wouldn't stand and and do that you know and so and then after you know then we're praying in the name of jesus christ and it says in the name that is above every other name jesus christ you know as we're praying and i looked at my wife and i says boy you thought you'd ever be doing that doing the pledge of allegiance and kind of the Apostles' Creed, right, in, in, in that whole picture, you know, of that. You know, the Catholic Church has their view of the Apostles' Creed. They kind of add that bottom section that I kind of read to you there in regard to that. But, you know, it, it kind of adds flavor to what we are doing. We believe in the resurrection. We believe in those things. We believe in who Jesus is. The similarities. But did you, would you think you'd ever do that? Well, it wouldn't allow her to do that. She says, man, I would have did that. And not too long ago, we were just singing a song and we were saying, you know, praise Father, Son and Holy Ghost. And and, you know, and, and the word Trinity comes on our screen here and we're, we're singing, you know, these words, Trinity. And I whispered in her ear and I said, did you ever think you would be singing that? She says, I would have been shunned. We would have been ostracized from the church. Well, where's the freedom? Yet they believe that they have truth. What they have is a lie. They don't know Jesus. Same thing with the Mormons. They say to a degree, well, we believe that, you know, God is one, monotheism. We also believe that he is a trinity, but they have a weird view of the trinity. They believe in three separate gods in the sense that they believe because they say when you die, and if you die a good Mormon, and this is for men only, okay, that you will die, sorry, ladies, you will die and you'll become your own God over your own planet. And you're going to be the guy that populates the planet. You know, the guys are like, oh, praise the Lord for that one, right? Just weird stuff. Lucifer and Satan and Jesus are brothers. They were God's two sons. One had a plan of redemption that God accepted and the other was rejected. And thus the two brothers have not gotten along since. So the Christian faith has now been summed up into two brothers having a fight. And God has a favorite son and doesn't like the other. You know, and it just, you know, I've, I've been at lengths in conversations and discussions and, you know, I, I don't. I say it more with the thought that you guys know what we're talking about when I'm dealing with them. Obviously, it's more theological. It's more deep in the conversations and I'm drawing things out of them and getting them to really understand. And most of the time I'm playing stupid. Like, I don't know what I'm talking about and asking them more questions because I can get more out of them that way. The Bible says be wise as a serpent and gentle as a dove. You got to be tactful. But the issue is their lack of truth. So there are people that, you know, they might have been good people as Jehovah's Witnesses. They might have been good people as Mormons. They might have been very good people. There's good people in the world that have no religion. They're just good people. And it could be a sweet little old grandma that, you know, this is all she knew because this is all she was taught. And she's the sweetest lady. Let me tell you, she will be the sweetest lady in hell if she doesn't know the truth. And this is why the Great Commission is not called go and preach the gospel or go and witness to somebody. It's called the Great Commission. That's what the gospel is. To go and speak the truth of who Christ Jesus is. What other reason? Why would they crucify Christ? For what other purpose? For what other reason? For the very fact that he said to the religious establishment of his day, I am God. And remember, they they wanted to kill him themselves. 
We read the whole story. We went on this whole topic of John chapter 8. Remember when he finally told them. And they says, you know, our father Abraham. And I love what Jesus says. He goes, your father Abraham? He says, your father Abraham longed to see my day. And he saw my day and he rejoiced. They're like, whoa, what, what do you mean? You're, you're not even 50 years old. Abraham's been dead. How can Abraham have saw? He says, before Abraham was. And Jesus uttered those words, I am the words only God said in Exodus chapter 3 when he, Moses said, who do I say sent me? I am. And the Bible says immediately they took up stones and they wanted to kill him on the spot. And why didn't they kill him? Because he wasn't supposed to die by stoning. It had already been prophesied that he would be crucified, Psalm 22. So we see all these truths. Listen, out of the 364 prophecies of Jesus Christ in his three and a half years of earthly ministry, three and a half years, he fulfilled 351 of those prophecies. As his coming in, being born into this world, all the prophecies of his birth, all the prophecies of him being Messiah, 351. You might say, what about the rest? They will be fulfilled at his second coming. So when Pontius Pilate said, what is truth? There's the truth. Guys, I was listening kind of the close of the sermon last week and one of the things that i talked about was anything outside of the gospel is false and it's true anything outside of that is false and so what we find here in the text that i think is important for us to see looking at these verses the first thing is christ is characterized by his penetrating decisive judgment and what are they being judged for goes back to this introduction of truth. And to the angel of the church of Thyatira. Now, the church here of Thyatira was a small colony. It was not really a big church. It was probably the most significant, insignificant, excuse me, city of the cities that are being represented here. But Thyatira, the, the word has an interesting name. It, it's derived of two words. And and, and, and one, of it, one of the words here in the very beginning, Thea, kind of has the idea of deity. But the word actually means odor of affliction. And, and the city was known, ultimately, as we can see in the book of Acts in chapter 16, was known for its, you know, its selling of purple and dyes. Remember that it was there in Acts chapter 16 where Paul met a woman named Lydia, who was from the city of Thyatira. The Bible says in Acts 16 that she was a woman who was a seller of purple, meaning that she was involved in this trade. She was wealthy. And this city actually was, was actually founded by those who Alexander the Great left in charge after his passing. We know one of the dynasties known as the Seleucid dynasty. And ultimately, this was conquered by Rome um, in 190 B.C., and the community was also known for its, its military post. It had a small military post, and it, and it was situated between the city of Pergamos and the city of Sardis. And the significance that we see here in the text is that it had a city that it was a city that had its own troubles, but even more so, there was a church there. We don't know much about the church other than what's stated here. We don't have record in the New Testament as to who started this church. Perhaps maybe it could have been a Bible study by Lydia. We don't know. We, we, don't, we don't have the history of where she went after that. We know that the church of Philippi was birthed and Lydia was the first member, you can say, of the church at Philippi. This was a woman, according to Acts 16, that was down by the riverside. Remember that this is the person who God you kind of used to bring to fruition the Macedonian call in Paul's life. Remember, Paul had a different direction. Paul had a, a, a different place where he was going to go in Acts 16, but the Spirit suffered him not. So we see how the Lord intervened, and ultimately he got Paul to be redirected by the Spirit, and, and he received the vision of the Macedonian call. And when he went to this area, which is really the first church plant in Greece, in Europe, this was Paul's mission. And he goes and he finds these women. He didn't find a synagogue, so that means there was not enough Jews there. But he found these women worshiping the Lord by the riverside. Lydia was one of them. She was from Thyatira. 
So it could be that maybe she ministered to a relative. Maybe she ministered to friends. We don't know. This is all just speculation. But a church is birthed here. And what we find here as he's dealing with the church, here are some very important things that Jesus says here. To the angel of the church of Thyatira. Remember, the angel really is the messenger. And we can say in modern day, what would be the angel today? Like the pastor, the bishop, the leader of the church, so to speak. But he says here, to the angel of the church of Thyatira, write these things. Now I'd say odor of affliction. Well, where is their affliction? Well, we're going to see the affliction was self-inflicted. You know, there's afflictions that come as believers because we are serving the Lord, right? And we're following Christ. And we have those times where we have, you know, trials and adversity in our life. But sometimes afflictions are self-inflicted. Why? Because we're living in sin. We're practicing sin. And the Lord's dealing with our hearts. So some of this is the direct result of our sinfulness. So if Thyatira really means odor of affliction, well, I think their affliction was a direct result of their disobedience. Whatever the case might be, the Lord had a word of commendation. He commends them. He also has a critique for them. Excuse me. He also has a critique for them. And then in verses 21, 22, and 23, he condemns them. Now, look at what he says here in verse 18. These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and feet like fine brass. Notice the term here, says the Son of God. This is the first and only time it's used in the letter to the seven churches. And this, once again, points to who Jesus is, right? You can't be the son of God and not be God. It's kind of like that Philippians 2 thing where it says in Philippians 2, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal to God. You know, a lot of people have issue with that term, who being in the form of God, because you can't be in the form of God and not be God. So even Philippians chapter 2 clearly reveals that Jesus is God. Paul believed it, the early church believed it, Jesus believed it, preached it, and the scriptures clearly teach it. And so it says here, these things says the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire. Remember in chapter 1, this description, this revelation of Jesus here in chapter 1, in chapter 2. Now it's the words of this revealed Christ to his church. And remember some of the descriptions, it says that what? That he had fire in his eyes, right? It talked about his, his ability to be able to stand among the lampstands in verse 12 of chapter 1. He's in the midst of them in verse 13. He's clothed with garment down to his feet, girded about his chest with a gold band. This speaks of really authority and power. His feet were like fine brass. Notice that his head and hair were white as wool, white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. All this speaks of purity and piercing and perceiving judgment with his eyes. Feet of brass, judgment, refined in a furnace, and his voice is the sound of many waters. So this description here now plays a role here in Jesus' statement to the church. So he says, I am the one. In Revelation chapter 1, none other than Jesus himself. And remember Jesus' statements when he says in verse 11, he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. In verse 17 of chapter 1, he says again, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. And remember when you look to Isaiah, uh, the prophecy of Isaiah, the prophet, as he speaks concerning God, what does he say? He says that he is the first and he is the last, that God is. Isaiah 41. The first and the last. There is no other beside me. And you read those passages there in Isaiah, and he says, and who can declare it as I have? Let him set it in order. In other words, who can say the things that I said? The point being made is there is no other God beside me. But yet here's Jesus saying the very same thing that God said through the prophet Isaiah. What is Jesus saying? He's God. And he says in verse 19, he says, I know your works. And notice the five things that he puts down here. Your works of love, service, faith, 
patience or endurance or patient endurance. And as for your works, notice this. He already talked about works, but he's saying the last are more than the first. He says greater works. So there's works of love. There is works of service, of faith, works of enduring patience and greater works. So this was a church that was doing. This was a church that was busy. We can see that it was busy in many things. And notice something, A.W. Tozer, he writes these words, and I quote, it is a, it's dangerous to be so busy that you have no time to wait on God. This here is probably where we become, or perhaps those in the body, can become so mechanical at their Christian faith that there's no, they're not pliable no more. There's, there's no ability to discern their you know, everything is about, you know, either it's a job or it's a duty. There's no desire to draw closer to the Lord, no desire to, to know more of God, no desire to, you know, it just becomes mechanical. You become so busy, you don't even have time for God. And the sad reality today is that some churches are that. They, they got a lot going on, they're doing a lot, and, and it seems like they're making a lot of noise, but they're really getting nowhere fast. And then you look at the individual. Brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, you're supposed to be growing in the Lord. You're supposed to be falling more in love with Jesus. You're supposed to be wanting more. The sad reality is that today, the church just wants more of other things. And people want more things for themselves. And the things that they want for themselves doesn't include intimacy with God or nearness to God. And so they find themselves in, you know, just how you can say an unfulfilled life. And not only is it unfulfilled, but, you know, they're like, man, I'm, I'm a Christian. I, I, you know, I go to church. I serve God. Why, why, why is this happening? Or why, you know, all these things, because they have this this view of God that, that is not truth. The sad part for the churches here, these letters, this should awaken our understanding to know that, that really the problem with these churches is that they all somehow, through their you know, inability to, to stand on the truth, whether it's because of sin or the things that they did, all the critique that God had for them, minus one of the churches, they all created to a degree a God of their own understanding. This is why truth is so important. The truth of Scripture will keep you in line with the true God of Scripture. And so the Lord says here, you, you had works, you, you were doing good. And what we see here with the, the eyes like a flame of fire, well, the judgment of Christ is perceptive. And Jesus' judgment is powerful, feet like fine brass. And maybe, maybe, verse 19, maybe, I don't know, maybe they're thinking, well, there's not really nothing that we have that God could deal with us on because after all, I mean, we're, we're loving as best as we can. You know, sometimes our love is not biblical love. We think it is, and it's not. There was a church not mentioned here in the letter to the seven churches that the Lord had to correct their version of love. Their version of love was selfward. It was, it was not biblical love. As a matter of fact, their version of love was, was actually hindering the ministry. And it's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And Paul says to the church at Corinth, it has actually been reported that there is sexual immorality among you. Now, who would the letters go to? Obviously, the leaders of the church. In chapter one, it went to the leaders. He says, hey, there's divisions I hear that are among you. This is what I heard at Chloe's household. They got to me and they told me there's divisions among you. And, and he begins to call out the leaders of the church and he's saying, what's the problem here? You guys had truth. You guys had a rich working of the gifts and all these things, but 
But here's a man, when he says it's reported that there is sexual immorality among you, he's not saying that there's sexual immorality in the church. He's still speaking to the leaders. And he's saying there is sexual immorality among the leadership. And the issue is that it doesn't mean that leaders are sinless. What he's talking about here is that the sexual immorality that's among them, he's talking about a continual practice, a practice that is just being left alone. And such, and such sexual immorality is not even named among the Gentiles. What was so bad about this? Well, here was the sexual immorality, that a man has his father's wife. According to Scripture, this would be considered incest, a son with his mother. And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. Look at verse 2. That's pretty powerful. He says, rather than mourn, he says, you're puffed up, you're proud, arrogant. And really the thought behind this is the fact that they really felt that they were helping him. Paul says, by you not addressing it, by you not dealing with the matter, and in a sense you're saying among them, well, this is our brother and we're going we're gonna to work with him. We're gonna, we love him. Paul says, your love is proud, it's puffed up. You're, what you're doing is not working. You're, you're hindering, as a matter of fact. For indeed, as absent in the body but present in spirit, have already judged, Paul says, as though I were present, him who has so done this deed. Paul says, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. In other words, he's saying deal with it. You know, sometimes because truth is altered, and if you look at First and Second Corinthians, that was the issue. The truth that Paul had laid with the foundation of Christ had, had been perverted by this false truth by super apostles, and they came preaching something different, and, 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 and what they did was they were... They were teaching things that were not consistent with the gospel. And what we see here in the text is that they didn't deal with the matter. And the problem is today is that people don't like to deal with sin in their life. And they're worried about what others know about them. They're more concerned about what people think of them, not what God knows of them. You know, that's one of the most dangerous things against truth in the church where people are more concerned what people think. You hear them say things like, now people are going to think this. Who cares what people think about you? What should bring fear to your heart is what God knows of you. It shows where your fear is. You have more fear of man than you do of God. And if that's the case, then the Lord is not God in your life. Man is. It's man that you worship. And, and what did Paul do? Paul says, well, this is how you deal with sin in the church. He says, you take this man and you turn him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. The point being made was he says, you, you kick him out the church. This is not disfellowship. This is not shunning. The point that Paul was making was, if you go back to Jesus' statement on dealing with a sinning brother in Matthew chapter 18, the Bible says you first go to your brother yourself, yourself, and you say, this is what you've done. This is the offense. You've sinned against me. And if he listens to you, the Bible says then you've gained a brother. But if he continues in the same sin or something like it or continues doing what he's doing, then you take someone else with you. And now you confront him with not only yourself, but with someone there now to be a witness. So that person can't say, you never said that. Oh, I did. So-and-so was there to be a witness to this, you know, correcting. This is, this is biblical discipline. This is what Jesus said. This is how you deal with those who sin in the church and continue to sin. Now, all this could be bypassed at the very moment a person realizes they're sinning or everybody knows they are, but they repent immediately. Repentance, guys, listen, you can bypass all of this if true repentance takes place. And especially if the brother goes before you, 
and he shares this with you, and then you repent right there, that's it. It's a done deal. But there are some that don't. They want to continue on doing what they're doing, so you take someone with you. And then the Bible says, you know, if he listens, then, you know, you've, you've, you've won a brother. This is good. But if he doesn't, now what do you do? It's not three times the charm. Three times you're out. He says, then, if he continues to do so, you take him before the church. And you mark him for what he is. What he's done. The sin that he is. And what do you do? You now cast him out. The issue with the man here in 1 Corinthians 5 was that when he says, this is named among you, he's speaking to the leadership of the church and he's saying, there's actually an elder or a leader in the church, somebody that has position that is committing this sin. Now, there could be various reasons why they didn't want to mess with him. Some believe that the reason being is because he had great influence in the church. If we deal with this man, then a lot of people are going to go with him. It could be that he also had financial influence in the church. I mean, after all, he had his mom, right? Probably inherited his father's wealth. Who knows? But something was hindering them that they didn't want to deal with truth. They just wanted to kind of leave it. And, oh, eventually he'll stop doing that. Are you kidding me? Paul says this type of sin, incest with their own parent, is not even named among the Gentiles. The world doesn't even do this. And this is named in the church? So obviously the guy doesn't want to stop. This has been going on for a while. Here's what you need to do. You need to stop him from being any type of example or leader in the church. Put him out. He's not saying that he could never go to church. He's saying put him out of this position of authority, this influence over the church, and let the Lord deal with him. And ultimately that's what they did. And it worked. It worked. Because in 2 Corinthians in chapter 2, you read it there, Paul then has to write a letter to the Corinthians and say, listen, go and restore that brother that you put out, lest he become discouraged. And Satan comes in and really uses that. Because that's what happens when people are, are dealt with in the church, right? It happens. We have to. People don't like church discipline. And especially people that are all in their feelings and in their emotions. Nobody wants to be corrected. And I thank God that here at Living Way, yes, we've had to sit people down from ministry. Because of sin, because of various things, we've had to. Some people, it all depends on, it's, it's all happened in different types of ways. We've had people that have come and confessed sin in their life that they had struggles with that would, if they would have been caught, would have got them removed from ministry. But you always go back to that Proverbs 28, 13, right? That he who forsakes a matter, or he who, com he who conceals a matter will not prosper, but he who forsakes it finds favor with the Lord. So I've always applied that principle, and I says, well, if you come to us and you let us know this is the problem you have, then, then now we can help you, and true repentance can be done, and we can work with you. Now let's grow and let's move forward. But if you reject the warnings and you're exposed, then obviously there's consequences that come with that. It all depends. Ultimately, in either case, whether they came to us and revealed it themselves or they were caught, the first thing we sought immediately was restoration. Because for us, it didn't disqualify you but rather you needed to be corrected and there needed to be restoration. Just because a person, I don't want to use the term fall into sin because I think that's just a term that we use to try to make it seem cute. Oh, you know, I don't know what happened. I just fell into sin. Uh, no, you didn't fall into it, bro. You walked right into it. You were fully vested. Now you're caught. This is why you're feeling the way that you're feeling. That, that conviction is set in. Or it could be guilt. Sometimes people think they've truly repented because they've, they have this feeling of guilt and shame and it's not even conviction. But see, truth is what, what, is what sets all that apart. And, and then we restore them back to ministry. Well, how long? How long? Some six months, some a year. And you might say, where do you get that principle? Luke 13, the parable of the of the fig tree in the vineyard. 
that wasn't producing fruit. And the owner of the vineyard says, I'm going to come and I'm going to remove this tree. It's not producing fruit. And the worker of the ground said, no, let, give me one more year with it. Let me dig around its roots. Let me expose it for a little bit and let's see if fruit does come. And that's what we feel church discipline is. We got to now kind of dig around a little bit. You stop producing fruit. Ministry it wasn't in your heart no more. Now it's become mechanical. And if your heart's not in it, bow out. Because all you're doing is being a hypocrite. A hypocrite is not a person who, you know, acts one way and another. A hypocrite is a person, too, whose heart is not in it no more. And if your heart's not in it, that's not a way for you to say, well, my heart's not in it. I just need to take a break. It really sh says that just if your heart's not in ministry, if your heart's not in, in it to serve, then you're not serving the Lord. I don't think the issue is ministry. The issue is spiritual. Because you've left your first love. And, and, and there's no desire to do more. This clearly, what Jesus was saying here, your works are great. You got all this going on. Nevertheless, I have these few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. And when you look at this here, you, you kind of get an understanding here that, that ultimately he starts off in verse 19. He commends them for their... For, for their excessive tolerance, if you will. In verse 20, you allow, there's the tolerance. In verse 19, he, he commends them for their faithful works. And so in other words, we do faithful, we do good works for Jesus. And then we're to be growing in good works. But now there's this tolerance. Today we live in an age of tolerance. The church is to tolerate. We're to tolerate what the world does. And if we're not accepting of it, then we are called bigots, racist, haters, all these things. We have to guard against what the Lord is critiquing them for here in the church. This excessive tolerance, you know, sometimes we want to try to kind of like with the guy there in 1 Corinthians 5. Hey, Paul, don't worry about it. We got it, man. We, we're working with him. You know, he's a little hard headed. Paul's like, that's not good enough. Show him that he can do whatever he wants. But he can't do both. He can't claim to be one who loves God and one who loves sin. Like Jesus says, you can't serve God and mammon. You'll love one and hate the other. So show him what he loses if he chooses that. And so that's what they showed him. You lose this fellowship in the body, that, that which keeps you connected to the Lord. It doesn't mean that this man didn't love God. This man could have very well had a problem with sexual immorality in his life. Obviously he did. But what they did helped him because he was restored in Paul's second letter. He was brought back into the ministry. Imagine that testimony among the church. And imagine that learning lesson. You know what I often say? Man, when you go through that, remember there's a lot of things that are lost. In today's church, when one person does, when an elder does something bad, when, when one of the leaders in the church does something bad, it's interesting, rather than the church getting behind the rest of the leadership to restore this man, people get upset, they get bothered. They're like, wow, if that really happened, then maybe that's not the church for me. And they leave. And they never see God restore. They never see it. And the people that we've had to sit down in ministry... Some of them sat for several years. Not two, not three, four years. And then the Lord just started raising them up again. Why? Because they, they were restored first spiritually in their heart and their mind was renewed. And now they understood things different about the Lord. And, and the truth that was not compromised is the number one thing that they are so grateful for. But in the wake of that, others fell off. And I remember that there was 
one brother that, you know, was going through this time of restoration. And, and there was another young man that was going through the same thing. He had just kind of went in. So I told the, the one that was recent, I told him, go to this brother here. He's kind of been in this for a little while. He's kind of, he got a little bit of experience under his belt of dealing with being restored. Why don't you talk to him? So they had this conversation and I talked to the young man that had already been in this for a while. And I said to him, so what do you think? And he says, he just told me straight out. He's just not going to do it. He can't see himself sitting that long. So he wants us as a church to overlook what he was doing and just let him serve back and give him another shot. He doesn't want to be restored. He just wants us to take his word that he won't do it again. And he says, pretty much, yeah. I said, well, he's free to go do whatever he feels he needs to do. We're offering restoration to this day. To this day. I still see that young man. And when I see him, it's at just different churches where I go teach. He's not serving nowhere. His pride has put him on the shelf. It's mind-blowing. One simple thing. The purpose is so that we will learn to appreciate and we will not tolerate sin in our life. So what was some of the sins? He says, because you allow that woman Jezebel. Remember Jezebel? <laughs> Boy, the story of Elijah. Remember that story of Elijah's life, man, in 1 Kings? Boy, I'll tell you. 1 Kings chapter 16, all the way through 2 Kings chapter 9, if you want to read the life of this lady Jezebel. And just take note. Men and women that have been raised in the church all have biblical names, but nobody ever names their daughter Jezebel. So that should tell you something before you go and study her life, okay? This was an evil woman. She was diabolical. And she led her husband in the worship of pagan gods. We see this in 1 Kings 16. And she kills God's prophets in 1 Kings chapter 18. I mean, she's slaughtering the prophets of the Lord and murdering the righteous. And notice that there was so much that she did. She was evil, personified. And when God chastens here the church of Thyatira for this, like all of this stuff, he's saying you've tolerated it. In other words, you've allowed these things to be practiced. And notice something here, what he's saying, this, this personality of the church has taken on the identity or the personality of the practices of Jezebel. You know, some people say, oh, you know, every church takes on the personality of the pastor. I'm thankful that this church doesn't. But I've been to churches that do. They take the personality of the pastor, you know, and it's like, well, that's just because that's how our pastor is. I'm like, that's 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 pathetic, man. The body of Christ should take the personality of Jesus. Simple as that. And maybe the reason why the church is not taking the personality of Christ is because it's not Christ who's preached over the pulpit. It's that serve me kind of mentality. So, you know, kind of going back with all these things, you know, and, and I know I, I gave, you know, a list of false teachers last week. But but, you know, what's corrupting the church today in tolerating this and, and the personality of the church is. There's so much today that the church is allowing to let in. For fear of what? For fear of losing relevance with the world? Who wants to be relevant with the world? I mean, what has the world done for you? Rather, what did the world do to you? That now that you're in Christ and you look back and you say, I have no, or you should have no desire to go back. Right? Think about that for a moment. So there's this bad personality in the church. What else? She calls herself a prophetess. There's bad authority in the church. She teaches and seduces. There's bad theology in this church. And notice what else it says here. Seduces my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idol. There's bad morality, meaning immorality is being practiced. So this is his critique. He says, you got good works, but those things, are, you see a lot of times people think, well, you know, I, at least I go to church. <laughs> at least as if what you're God's greatest gift to Christianity, like you're the best thing that's happened since sliced bread. Give me a break.
And this is why the Bible says he's coming back for a church that's, that's without spot, without blemish, without wrinkle. Today, if there's ever a time where the church is living in this time of tolerance, it's now. So we need to guard against, you know, the personality problem in the church and the authority problem and the theology problem because there's not a lot of theology. Man, churches are very shallow today. They're not deep. In verse 21, he says, And I give her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Here, here's God's discipline. So he, he commends them. He critiques them. Now he condemns them. I give her time to repent. I love that. God gives us time to repent. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 says, God is not slack concerning his promises, as some count slackness. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. God always gives us time to repent. Some people get more time than others. You know, and, and I don't know how true this is, but you know, this, it, I just kind of was pondering this thought. I was speaking to an individual today and they were talking about how, you know, the Lord dealt with their heart and their life and the things that God revealed to them. And the question was that he had with God is he says, how come so many of my friends died? How come they didn't get the chance that I got? And he says, how come I'm, I'm able, you know, to, to get out of this and that? And they didn't make it out. You know, he was sharing his story with me. And then he says, he goes, I, you know, I don't really know how true this is, but this is kind of the way the Lord revealed it to me. Because, and then he said this, he goes, I believe in dedication. And I'm thinking like, I believe in dedication too. And he says, kind of like the thought is that we were dedicated to the Lord. And because we were dedicated unto God, we were spared. He goes, and I kind of look back, and I don't know if it's a coincidence, I don't know, but I looked at my buddies that, you know, kind of didn't make it, and he says, and they weren't raised in the church. You know, and I thought for a moment, I pondered, and I says, that is true. Once we belong to God, we are his forever. This is why it's so important here. God gives us this time and this, this ample time to repent. And what is the purpose of repentance? Well, it means to go in the opposite direction. So what about God's discipline here? We see that it's fair. Why? Because he gave time for repentance. You know, nobody's going to say that day that we all stand before the Lord. Nobody's going to say, God, you're not fair. As a matter of fact, you know what we're going to say? Even when our loved ones that did not accept Christ, that rejected him, when they're being cast into the lake of fire, you know what your words are going to be? Righteous and true are your judgments, O God. Because God's discipline, God's judgment is fair. Verse 22, Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into a great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. In other words, God's discipline or God's judgment is full. It's a heavy matter. I will kill her children with death and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. Notice here, God's judgment is final. And God's judgment is fearful. It should be. When he says here, I will kill her children, the point is, is that he will allow this church to experience what it's pursuing, death. Remember, the church of Thyatira was only about 40 years old. And what is the statement that's made? The church, the body of Christ today, is one generation away from extinction. Did you know that? We're one generation away from there not being a church. So the church of Thyatira kind of fits that mold because this is a church that's only 40 years old. And what is a generation? 40 years. In other words, the point that he's making is he says the next generation will not. So when he says I will kill her children, what he's saying is there will not be another generation from this church. It's going to die. The same thing happens to you and me. If we don't minister to the next generation, there won't be one. It's weird today, man. People worship 
conservatism and think it's Christianity. People worship politics. And because they feel they're on the right side of politics, they feel they're right with God. Listen, we vote our biblical values, not popularity. And we use that vote. It's the least we can do. That in prayer, a lot of prayer, right? But it's not some man that's going to save humanity. It's only God that can. So we also see here that he goes on to say in verse 24, as we prepare to close, and now to you I say and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden. Notice the depths of Satan. Guys, truth was, was abandoned. As we often say, whenever there's an absence of God, there is a presence of evil. Now, here's the challenge to them in verse 25. But hold fast what you have till I come. Hold fast what you have till I come. Listen, for some of you tonight, it might just be a little bit of faith. It might be a little bit of truth. God is saying, hold fast to that. Grow in that. Meditate on that. You know, the sad reality is today you look and, and, and the Bible says in, in the Gospels, it says, you know, when Christ comes, will he find faith in the earth? That's a good question, because today, if he were to come today, I mean, how much would he really find? How much would he find among the church? I mean, how much would he find in your life? You guys, can you be honest tonight and say, you know what? There's some things I would deal with if I knew Christ was coming in the next five hours. Would there be some things you needed to go, some wrongs you needed to make right, some things you need? Hello, church. Don't, don't be like the church of Thyatira. No, we got it. We're, we, we're, we're here, aren't we, pastor? <laughs> You're here by the grace of God and that alone, right? But, but think about that. So are there some things? Could you honestly say, yeah. I, I, I'm, I, I need to take care of some things. And this is basically what he's saying. Hold fast to what you have till I come. Look at what else he goes on to say here. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give over, give power over the nations. I love this. So here's the challenge. Hold fast. We will receive the authority of Christ's power. He'll give us power over the nations. And notice what he says here in verse 27, quoting Psalms chapter 2. And remember, that's a powerful psalm about Jesus. Psalm chapter 2 in verses 8 and 9. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, and they shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessel. This is a promise. So there's a challenge. There's a promise. And he says, as I also have received from my father, and I will give, here's another thing, him the morning star. We receive assurance of Jesus' presence. When you look in Revelation uh, chapter 19, you know that morning star at the close of the book of Revelation is none other than Jesus himself. And Jesus is saying, I will give you myself. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And how many of you here have more than one ear? All of us do. We have two. It's a double directive to you and me. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. You notice the issue with the church of Pergamos and the church of Thyatira. These are the two churches that are known really for exchanging truth. Ephesus left their first love. The persecuted church here doesn't really have a critique. The church of Smyrna was a church that was persecuted because they held fast to the faith. They trusted the Lord, persecuted church. And he encouraged them to remain faithful to the end. He challenged them to remain faithful and gave them a promise that they would receive the crown of life. And guys, listen, tonight you have the ability, you have the means by which to stand on the promises of God's word and take this and not just treat it as 
I go to church, but treat it as I am a child of God. What does that say about you? It says a lot of things. It says a lot of who Jesus is for you and for me. So tonight, what is our truth? We live in that world today, right? <laughs> Where people say, well, your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth, right? Everything is relative. Relativism. And the reality is there's only one absolute truth, and that is the word of God. There's no other truth except this truth here. Jesus said it, and it's not only the word of God, but it's Jesus himself, because in John 14, 6, he says he is the truth. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes unto the Father but by me. Guys, can I tell you the story has not changed. The truth over 2,000 years ago is still the truth today. But the enemy will get you to think all kinds of things. Oh, no, you know, the Bible is outdated. You know, it's, it's written by man. Anybody ever heard that argument? The Bible is written by man? You guys heard that? I had them come and debate. You don't, you don't know. You, you don't know. You, you, you did too much drugs, they tell you. You did too much drugs. You were in prison and you know, all that stuff. And you, you don't know. You know you, you're not an educated man. I say, well, I know the Bible. And I believe every word in it, 843,000 words, and I believe every single one of them. Even the commas, the apostrophes, the periods, and all that, I believe all of that. Well, Jesus said it, not one jot or one tittle. All of it's inspired by God. And they say, well, you know, you gotta, you gotta expand your thinking. I said, I tried that once and wasted years of my life. You say, wow, you know, the Bible is just not reliable, man. It's written by man. Is man perfect? No. Are you perfect? No, I'm not. Well, it was written by man. Well, who wrote those books that you gained all your knowledge from? I mean, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but, you know, I was kind of thinking like, well, aren't those books written by man? Yeah, they are. Hmm, interesting. The difference between your men and the men that wrote the scriptures is that the men of scriptures were inspired of the Holy Spirit. This word is God breathed. You know, and I'll tell you, I might not be an intellectual man, but I've walked the streets that Jesus walked, climbed some of the mountains that prophets and apostles have climbed in the land of Israel. And I'm blown away that without a doubt, without a doubt, I always tell people, if you can make one trip to Israel, go. I've been there. This next trip we do in 25 will be my 11th trip to Israel. And I'll tell you, like Pastor Chuck always said, it's one trip to Israel is like a year in seminary. You'd never be the same again. There's no doubt there is a God in heaven. And he left us his word to live by daily. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you.